Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Is the volume good? Okay. Thank you all for having me today. Yeah, I am a nursing home administrator. That's what pays the bills. But I'll be 55 in nine days. I have been shooting for 51 of those 55 years. Guns have been an instrumental part of my life since I was four years old. Now, we just had lunch. Everybody's gonna take a nap on me. I know that's how it typically goes after the, the, the speaker after lunch. I hate being read to, but there's a little bit here I am going to read to you. Very little, when we get rid of the paper, I'm done reading to you. Situational awareness is being akin to taking the blinders off so many, that many people have today. Pay attention to the world around you. Keep your eyes glued to the screen as you can't, I mean back up. Pay attention to the world. Don't pay attention to Facebook, your phone, the phone call. When you go into Walmart, Kroger's, Food City, wherever, how you carry yourself will be whether or not you're a potential target or not. Hold your head up. Don't be like Barney Fife and just totally crazy with it. But hold your head up. Walk with a purpose. Again, don't have that cell phone in your hand with your eyes glued to the screen. Deal with that in the car before you leave. When you get out of the vehicle to go in a store, be focused on getting to the door. But don't have tunnel vision. Scan the parking lot is what's going on around you folks. Okay. There was a double blind study done. It's probably about 15 years old now. They sent out a camera crew. And they filmed four people. A five foot nothing female Caucasian. A five seven five eight gentleman, a six four black gentleman, and a six five ten five eleven female. They watched them, they filmed them for several hours going on about their daily life. At that point, they take that footage and they go into a prison system. They go to death row. These fake folks have nothing to lose. And they go in and they show these four people going on about their daily business. And they ask these killers, which ones, uh, are there any of these folks you would attack? Are there any folks you won't attack? Which two were attacked? The large black gentleman and the large, larger white lady. And then they ask, why would you attack them and not the two smaller people? The two smaller people were paying attention as to what was going on around them. The other two were oblivious to the world. Turns out, the small, petite female was a New York City detective. Turns out, the smaller guy was a former Army Ranger. Now, the film crew that showed it to the prisoners didn't know that information. So it was totally an honest answer. Know what's going on around you, situational awareness. If y'all close your eyes right now, you know how to get out of this room? <laughs> I mean, when you go into any business, a restaurant, Walmart, Know where you are in proximity to the exits because you may have to get out. Okay, <clears throat> watch for alert signals. Guess what? I was in the restroom a while ago. I'm not, you know, this gentleman knows me and a couple other folks know me. How many times have you seen me in a suit and tie? Never. <laughs> 
rarely that I've got a jacket on or a tie in my job. I normally just have a, a dress shirt on and pants. So it's hot outside, you know, I've got a jacket on. But something to be mindful of, I made a comment intentionally to a guy in a restroom a while ago. He's not in here, I don't think. No. I said, it's really bad to be sweating this bad inside an air-conditioned room or an air-conditioned building. Now, he had no clue what I was doing today. And it was not like I was nervous. I was just running back and forth getting stuff in here. So from the vehicle in, when that, you caught me outside, that was my third trip in. So uh, it, was, it was getting stuff together. So I was sweating. Now, somebody sweating inside a air-conditioned room that's, what, 68 degrees, 70 degrees, that's something you might want to look at. They might have something up their sleeve. Okay. Now, again, know your exits and use your senses. All of them, folks. We got any runners in here? Walkers that go out in the parks and walk and, and exercise? Okay. The, uh, the class I did for Ethra about three weeks ago, I guess, I got an email from a lady. She said she lived in uh, Alder Springs. She always comes to the Kroger's there in Oak Ridge doing grocery shopping. She said, typically, I put my, and I'm going to date myself, my Walkman, whatever, the earbuds in, and I listen to music while I grocery shop. She said, after your presentation, it was eye-opening to realize that I was muting one of my senses, which you are. If you put in earbuds and <coughs> go for the walk out in your, in your area, whether it be out in the country, city park, whatever, something could be going on behind you and you're oblivious to it because you can't hear what's going on. You got your eyes, you got your hearing. Taste is probably the least of our senses when it comes to situational awareness and being safe, but that can happen too. We've all heard of our sixth sense, the hairs on the back of your neck standing up, something may happen. Listen to that, folks. God gave us what he gave us. Our head on a swivel to look around what's going on and to be mindful of what's going on around you. This isn't something that you're... Today is to get you all thinking. That's all this is about today. I can't teach you how to take down an armed intruder. I can, but it's not going to be today. Um, I've got 50 years of knowledge dealing with firearms and other weapons. And you were in the military, I know. Several, a lot of you were in the military. I know people that were. If you're ever in a situation like this, it will be the most traumatic thing you ever experience, probably, unless you've been in actual combat. Because you are in combat. You and the attacker in a game of life and death. And hopefully it's your life that you're going to save. Alice training. Alice training came about after actually the second mass school shooting. Columbine was the one we all remember. West Memphis, Arkansas actually occurred first. But Columbine was the first, the first one that's really made notoriety. I believe that was 20 years ago. We just passed April 20th when that happened. And as a result of that, the gentleman that developed Alice, he was a former military, law enforcement, and his wife was a school principal. And he realized that what they're teaching in schools several years ago and I hate to say what's still being taught in school today in a, lot of area, in a lot of states is not effective. So what he came up with was a program called Lockdown Inform, Counter and Evacuate. And his wife being the educator and probably the smarter of the two said, you're not going to have an acronym or the title of something, the acronym is LICE in a school. So he had to add Alice to it. Are they prepared today when today is not like yesterday? 
Okay. That's not working. Well, I'm going to drive the manual way. Guys, we live, we live our work. Hmm. This thing not working, period. There we go. Why is citizen preparation necessary? 25 years of mass shootings has a national response time for law enforcement. Any idea how long it is? Guess. How long? 10. It's actually five to six minutes. And that's all relevant as to where you are, folks. I've been actually off of Hardin Valley. We've caught, I've been there for a little over nine years. We've called 911 twice for um, law enforcement. About 15 minute response time. So we're out in the country, per se. It depends on where you live, but the national average is five to six minutes. Okay, we can prepare for a fire, a tornado, a hurricane, but how do you prepare for an active shooter situation? We can't do it the way we should do it because, number one, it would traumatize everybody in this room. Uh, I checked in with uh, the KPD officer here today to tell him what I was doing for the simple reason was I wanted him to be informed that if he walk, would walk in here and some of the things we're talking about, he may think that I am the bad guy, which in theory I guess I can be, but I'm not. So how do we train for an active shooter situation? Number one, you get educated, which we're starting here. Again, what I told you guys, this gets you thinking. That's all it does. What could I do? What should I do? What would I do? Now, let's see here how I'm going to get this little nice video to play. Technology is always the, the weak part of me. We got three natural responses, guys. We're going to fight, we're going to run, or we're going to freeze. Lots of times what's going to happen in a situation that you've not experienced before is you're going to be thinking, this cannot be happening to me. No, I'm dreaming. This isn't working. No, this can't be. You're just going to freeze in place. The next thing you can do is run. If there's something happening in this hallway back here, what's the best course of action? Run out the back door. If something's happening back there, you need to go out this way. The best fight you're in is the one you're never actually engaged in. You avoid it. But what happens if you've got a fight? Now, if something's happening at that back door, there's nothing I can do at this distance unless I have a firearm. If the threat is from here to the computer screen here, I can deal with it with what I got. It's going to matter where you are in proximity to the threat. Now, this is an actual school board meeting that was being filmed like we're filming here. And this is an actual shooter, actual gun. People get shot. But what I want you to observe is what they didn't do. Okay? Can you all hear that? Real gun, real shooter, 
He's telling everybody else to leave. He turns his back here. Hey, sir. John, John, just let him talk. He's a good talk. John, go ahead. That little lady is the only person that did anything here. Those grown men did nothing. He's turned his back. They could attack him or they could go out that side door. They could have run right there. You see, uh, our benefits are right. You see what I'm saying? Please explain to us, sir. Please explain to us. I'm not sure if you can the worst to work. We'll talk to you. Come on, you're the one with the great one. Hey, listen, listen to me. Look, look, I'm a good guy. I've got a lot. saying he's going to die. Just property. 
don't say it. And here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want anybody, listen, just listen to me for a minute. I don't want anybody to get hurt, and I, I've got a feeling that when she wants the cops come in and kill you because you're, you're bad, because you said you're going to die. But why? This is, this is a it. This is a problem. Please don't. Please don't. Okay, that was real, folks. The shooter knew that what the five to seven minutes was the average response time. He knew that law enforcement was rolling toward that school board meeting. But he knew he was going to die tonight. He had determined that when he walked in there that he was going to die either suicide by cop or he would shoot himself. You saw him go down there. He did get shot and he did take his own life. No one else of the school board were injured that night other than they were scared which shows you, you know, he was in pretty close proximity to those guys, but he missed. Now, there's an old saying that I repeat a lot. You might get shot in a gunfight. You will get cut in a knife fight. So, people can survive getting shot at. People can survive being shot. You know, there's lots of folks out there that get shot every day. Some die. But the majority of them do survive because of bad bullet placement. And guys, uh, I'm going to stop here and interject. What you see on television and movies and Hollywood, well, that's not the real world. If Waylon back there pulled out a gun and shot me up here on the stage, I'm not going to go flying backwards back into the screen. Depending on where he shoots me, I may fall flat if he hits my spinal column or takes my brain out of service. But if he shoots me in the arm, he may, if he shoots me in the leg, he may fracture the femur, I may go down. But what kills people in a gunfight is blood loss are those two areas I just mentioned getting hit. Now, when I was out back here, I was talking to the IT guys, and they were talking about 22s. 22 long rifle is probably the most popular, prevalent caliber out there in the world. It's not a good fight stopper, it's better than nothing. But where a normal handgun round will penetrate heavy muscle mass and bones, a 22 will hit it and bounce around all inside of you. That's what happened with Ronald Reagan. When Hinckley shot Reagan with a 22, the bullet went in up upper chest. It ends up in the lower abdomen area. That little bullet is bounced all over the place. And if it hadn't been for the awareness of his Secret Service agent, Reagan would have bled out. But he didn't, which gets you to the point, folks. There is no such thing, and we've heard this. We're all, most of us are of the age, you're going to know what I'm talking about, you say the magic bullet that took out JFK. There is no magic bullet, folks. They go pretty much in a straight line unless it is the 22 which can bounce around inside of you. It's going to go through and until it hits something it's going to stop it or exit out. Now, I'm not going to get into too much gun stuff, but what, it, what responses did you observe here? The little lady with the pocketbook was the only person that did anything. Those guys sat there totally frozen in time and did nothing. They had ample opportunity to run out that door or to attack him when he turned his back, yet they did nothing. The first video did not play, so I'm going to tell you about it. What they teach in schools today, folks, 
If you're in school, if we're in the classroom today, and this facility goes in lockdown, what are you going to do? We're going we're to lock the doors if we can. Can those doors be locked from the inside? N no, I'd probably not. Okay. You're going to turn the lights off, and you're probably if we hear a shooter out there, what's taught in the schools is go to a, the furthest corner away from their door and turn the lights off and hide. That's what's taught in most school systems, guys. How do you think it makes the kids feel if something truly really was happening? Fearful and could do absolutely nothing. Now, those doors have got a uh, automatic closer on them. Guess what? There's nothing in this room that's going to stop rounds. Rounds being gunfire. There's nothing in here that's going to do it. This podium may stop a little bit, but it's not bulletproof. If you've got a belt on, you can wrap around that top closer and cinch it down tight, and that door can't be opened. Just cinch it up there. Now, I can't reach that one. I don't know if I could reach those back there or not. But there's chairs back there. You get up on a chair. You can do a lot of things in a high stress situation if you've thought it out. But that's the thing, guys. I want you to think about what could I do? What would I do? Number one, if, if this complex, if there's an active shooter on this complex today, this whole system, this whole campus is going to go into lockdown. Okay? Now, we're in lockdown, but we don't have a clue where the shooter is unless we're getting phone calls, text messages, or other means of communication. Come on in, sit down, I don't bite. You can sit up here in the front. <laughs> but communication is vital, folks. You know, I'm assuming there's a PA system in this, in this building. And there is a security department watching video cameras. It does no good for us to say, hey, the campus is on lockdown. This is a pretty good sized complex here. It might be in lockdown at the front entrance because something crazy has happened over there. But they've locked this down to be safe. But we need to know that. We need to know that the auditorium in the School of Pharmacy, there's a problem here. Number one, so people can avoid it. And number two, so that if you're in proximity to it, you can go the other way. Or you can, if you're the hero, stage yourself somewhere so if the attacker comes by, you could possibly intervene. Again, guys, you're going to be the first responder in two ways. You're going to be the first responder to try to take out the threat. You're also going to be the first responder for first aid and trauma care. Are y'all law enforcement? Did you see right here? And, okay, I couldn't see what the shirts were. Okay. Um, here's what happens, guys, in the real world. Something's happening right here, and there's people get shot on this in this part of this building today. Law enforcement's going to come in and secure the scene. They may step over everybody because the shooter, the scene is not secure. EMS is going to be staged out here in this circle waiting to get in. But they're not going to be allowed to come in until the scene is secure. Remember that, guys. Number one, you're the first responder for taking out the threat. Number two, you're going to be the first responder if if somebody in this room gets shot and you're, or, or you get shot, you got to be able to take care of yourself, okay? Columbine High School. This, folks, is the actual 911 tape from the librarian at Columbine High School. I'm going to call my high school.
You can hear the panic in her voice. She doesn't she doesn't know what to do. You can hear the gunfire, folks. shooters just entered the library. Guys, in 1999, it's still being taught today. Kids get on the floor, get under the desk, under the table, and that's what she did. She followed the process and school procedures that were in place. 
in Columbine High School. Now, 98% of the time in an active shooter situation, there's only one shooter. Columbine had two. San Bernardino, California had three. The one that just happened a couple weeks ago, or last week, was two. 98% of the time, if you hear gunfire in this hallway, you're safe to go that way. So get out. Get out of the situation. Aurora, Colorado, one shooter in the movie theater. Guys, there's no place immune to it anymore. Look at Knoxville. Several years ago, I think it was Central High School, there was a shooting over there. Park West Hospital parking lot, there was a shooting. There was a shooting at Shenandoah Nursing Home off Middlebrook. A resident's uh, husband comes in, she has Alzheimer's, he comes in, he kills his wife, and he takes his own life. I think that was July the 4th, 2002. Shenandoah and Maryville in the parking lot. A dietary worker's estranged spouse shows up, she gets out, out to go to work, he shoots her down in the parking lot. Similar situation happened in, I think, Crossville uh, a couple years ago. A husband walks in, his wife has Alzheimer's, he shoots the spouse, the resident. She doesn't die, and he takes his own life. Be mindful, folks, of the people that you're dealing with. <clears throat> because I don't know how, I guess we're all basically in healthcare to one form or another. I don't know what, what the room entails with folks. We're healthcare. I know some property management folks are here. Ethra, uh, Tom's from a nursing home. We got this old guy right here. He's just from the community. That I, I see occasionally. No, good guy. But, you know, we don't ever know. Places we go in life, nowhere is safe anymore. As we were growing up as kids, we didn't lock the doors in our house. Didn't think about it. Most of us didn't. Now, you probably lock it when you go in. Probably turn the alarm on if you've got an alarm. Because you never know what's going to happen in this world. Now, what's the lessons learned here from Columbine? Now, <clears throat> this is the library, folks. Here. This is the hallway that the gunman entered. It's coming down, you heard it. You have a dead kid, another dead kid, here, here, two here, here, one here, one shot here. Uh, here's where the most carnage at Columbine happened was in the library. Now, here's something ironic, guys. If it would have been a fire drill, what would the kids have done? They would have got up from their seats and proceeded around this route and gone out the door. Why didn't they do that in an active shooter situation? because they weren't trained to do that. They were not trained. They were told, you know, I, don't, I remember my high school librarian, she was probably the meanest woman there in the whole school. So she said something to somebody, people listened. That was just her nature. My mama was a librarian too at one time, so I guess that kind of deals, comes, how, comes right around. But, you know, these kids follow the teacher's instructions. Were they wrong? Monday morning quarterbacking it, yes. But what she followed the correct procedures as to what they'd been trained to do. Hide and stay down. So it was okay to leave after. And when and when the shooting was over and all everything was said and done, law enforcement came in, cleared the scene, they followed their escape route out that door. It was okay to leave after but not before. Now, we're going to fast forward a few years to Virginia Tech. What happened at Virginia Tech? A lot of carnage happened at Virginia Tech. 
We're going to take one classroom. The second floor, this classroom. <clears throat> room 206, there was 14 people present in the room. Ten of them got killed, two of them wounded. They didn't do nothing but hide. Room 211, 19 were present. 12 were killed, 6 were wounded. They did nothing. Room 207, they barricaded the door, but not the best in the world. There were 13 people present, 5 of them got killed, 6 wounded. Room 205, they barricaded real good. 12 present, 0 killed, 0 wounded. 204, 204 is an anomaly, folks. 204 had a Jewish professor in it who had survived the Holocaust. He knew what gunfire was. He had a plan as to what was going to happen. Mind you, they're on the second floor of a college campus. He barricaded it, and the kids jumped. Two of them were killed, three of them were wounded. The three that were wounded wasn't due to gunfire. It was due to injuries sustained in the fall from about 25, 30 feet up. But guess what? It was ankle injuries like a, and a knee injury. They lived another day. The two that were killed was the college professor and the last student he was helping to get out the door or out the window. This professor had a plan. He, he knew what to, he knew it was possible, and he had thought this out in advance. <clears throat> if you're passive and do nothing, there were 28 fatalities in that one, one college uh, class building. When you're proactive and did something, two people died. Alice, common sense, not common knowledge. Alice is not a linear progressive program. You can alert, lock down, inform, counter, and evacuate all basically in one motion. I can be yelling that there is a shooter in this room while I am attacking him or countering him while somebody else is evacuating. So you don't have to take, you don't have to alert and lock down. It's not a linear process. Things happen very quickly. It's a fluid and dynamic event. Information is the key, folks, and it's got to flow both ways. We've got to know where the problem is so we can deal with it. And again, that may be text messages, PA, Twitter, all this other new fangled stuff that I don't understand, or just a flat out phone call. <clears throat> if all we do is say, we're locking this building down. We don't know why, where, what's going on. But if we say that gunman is in the administrative hallway out here, the main lobby, then we know where to avoid the problem. When should doors be locked? Anytime they can be. You know, this campus seems fairly open for what I've been here this is my second time here I came over the day before yesterday and brought the presentation to make sure it worked but <clears throat> it seems like it's fairly open but locked doors folks all they do is provide a time barrier remember that a time barrier it's still going to be the lock still going to be defeated that classroom that was barricaded real good, the gunman went to it, he tried to get in, he couldn't, he moved on to an easier target. So that's what you gotta remember, folks. Barricade and barricade well. <clears throat> now, if you look at the, this door, that door opens out. You piling chairs up in front of it is gonna do little or nothing other than buy you a little bit of time because that person will open the door and they'll knock the chairs over then they'll come in the room. This style, the way this is, this is barricaded, that door's not going to open until that two before breaks or the strap breaks. <clears throat> if we've got bookcases, 
think filing cabinets, that sort of thing. We put that in front of the doors. That will uh, be a good deterrent to somebody. It will also stop incoming rounds. Again, inform in real time. It does me no good to know what happened five minutes ago. This is a fluid and dynamic situation. It's going to be occurring so fast. You got to be able to, to get the information. <clears throat> if you're the closed circuit security guy, you can be the play-by-play -play announcer so that you can let people know, okay, the attacker is going down this hallway. He's now turning left. He's going into this area of the building. Be the play-by-play -play announcer, but don't put yourself in danger to do it. <clears throat> okay, here's something crazy, guys. In an active shooter situation, the active shooter has a hit ratio of more than 50%. Police, on the other hand, have a hit ratio of 20 to 30%. Now, is that because the active shooter is a much better shot than law enforcement? No. No. What that means is the active shooter is going to shoot everybody in this room. Non-discriminatory, all he wants is a high body count. He or she wants is a high body count. Law enforcement is going to try not to hit us and hit the bad guy. So, that is the reason there's a disparity there in the hit ratios. <clears throat> now, I want you all to watch this. It's kind of funny in a way, but it kind of reflects on... This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Why? It's easy to miss something when you're not looking for it, guys. Now, in an actual shooting situation, something as limited as a coffee cup, a water bottle, office settings, staplers, trash cans, chairs, all that's going to disrupt that shooter. If my intent is to go down this aisleway and shoot everybody, that it's, I'm close to there on the outside aisle and somebody throws a phone at me it's going I'm going to have to either dodge the phone or I, my whole thought pattern is disrupted so then I have to start again so what you've got to do guys is interrupt that shooter you may not be Rambo that you're going to go pick him up and do a body slam and throw him down but if you can throw hot coffee in his face or whatever is in the, the cup up there, uh, you know, it's going to cause a different reaction. You're doing something. If you sit idle and do nothing, all you're going to be is a target. And I, I can't tell you what to do, folks. I can't do that. That is in your head. You know what your physical limitations are. You know what your mindset is. But again, what I've said, this whole presentation is to get you to think, what could I do? We are in so many areas now that are gun-free zones. And this isn't a politically correct statement I'm fixing to make, and I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Probably 99% of the shootings occur in gun-free zones because the good people with guns obey and keep their guns in the vehicle. The bad people don't care. The Aurora, Colorado theater shooting, 
That guy drove by two theaters that was closer to his house and went to the third one that was posted saying no guns allowed. Because he knew that probably he wouldn't be met with a good guy with a gun. So think about that, folks. Think about that. So we're in a gun-free zone. What can we do to protect ourselves? You're seeing me here with this nice little green pointer. But this isn't just a green pointer. It's a green military style laser that will set paper on fire if I hold it in one spot long enough. You hit somebody in the face with this, in their eyes, they're not going to be able to see you to attack you. It's also a decent impact weapon. Mace, tear gas, all that nice stuff. You can carry it. Now, be mindful of two things using tear gas or mace. Number one, it does have an expiration date on it. So you're going to need to cycle it out as it expires. And number two, if you're outside and the wind is blowing into your face, don't spray it into the attacker's face because it's all going to get blown back into your face and you're going to have a bad day. Now, <clears throat> other things you can carry. I came in a while ago, about 30, I saw two ladies walking with backpacks. Can y'all think what all can be concealed in a backpack? Well, you know, we hear about bombs and everything else. What about an Uzi? <laughs> 32 rounds in the gun. Now, again, guys, I said this, this is to make you all think. You have to assume in today's world that everybody you encounter is armed and has the potential to do you harm. When I checked in with the officer a while ago, I kept pulling stuff out and he was like, uh huh. I have more firepower than he did. <laughs> you know, and that's not, it, it, this is for demo purposes, guys. You know, but if you carry a gun, you need to have it easy. If you carry a gun, you need to be proficient in not just the gun you carry, but other weapon systems. Because, I hate to say it, but it's the truth, he wanted to clear up and show that these guns were empty. No clue what to do that music. I said, let me have it, I'll show you. <laughs> you know, and it's not, you know, he just hadn't been trained. Those aren't common around these parts. AR-15s are. You know, I thought about bringing one of those, but this was easier to conceal. Uh, but that sort of mindset, guys, you need to think what could happen wherever. Walmart, <coughs> behind Sam, or beside Sam's own Walter Springs. 
That's my normal. If I go to Walmart, I drive. I live in Cobb County, Parentsville. I'm 70 miles east of here. Uh, Walmart is the Walmart out there is the one I usually stop in. No, 5.30, 4 to 6 in the morning, I pretty much got the store myself. You don't have to be concerned with any shoppers. Well, I was in the back of that Walmart. It's been three, four years ago now. And I had to go to the bathroom. Now, where is the most dangerous place that a man can be? I'm sorry, but it's the truth. He's standing in here. So, guess what? They don't ever go to yours. I walk in the Walmart, the restaurant, and there's a guy there washing his hands. Okay, I'm observing him washing his hands. I go in the stall, I lock the door. And yeah, that is a little flimsy lock, like they all are. But guess what? All locks do by time. So, do my business, come out, the guy's still washing his hands. And I'm thinking, some, you know, things are happening. Doug's thinking, and it's like something's not quite right here. Now that was in, had, had had them remodel. So the two uh, wash basins, you're basically elbow to elbow. Well, I'm washing my hands. It's winter time. I've got a jacket on. There's fire on my hip. And at that point, I'm washing my hands, and my jacket comes up, and my shirt comes up. And the guy says, nice watch. <laughs> that was the last for Doug. I turned on him and cleared. And I'm, there's a guy over here behind me at the paper towel dispenser. I don't know if they're together. This guy here that washed his hands, the grease monkey, washed his hands for 15 minutes. He knew what that action was. Because his eyes got about this big. Guy here with the paper towels, he didn't know what was going on, other than something wasn't pleasant fixing the happen. I made eye contact with him, and he was going out the door. So I knew at that point he was just an innocent bystander who got caught up in this. I go follow him out the door. We go. I left my buggy. I'm done shopping. Man, back up. But I just made, and we were both going up toward the front. He said that wasn't going to be a pleasant experience, and there wasn't. I said, no, sir, it wasn't. You never know what's going to happen, guys. So when that sixth sense kicks in, listen. You know, it was unusual. You know, the guy washed his hands for so long, and then he made that comment, and that was that, that something wasn't right. It's the back of the store. Not many employees. I think there's 10, 12 employees at that time was working there. So you got to be mindful of that, guys. Listen to that sixth sense as to what's going on in the world. Now, a lot of people don't wear watches. You got one on. Hey, can I have time? Okay, what did he just do? He took his eyes off of me somewhat and looked down, which would have been a perfect time for me to do something. He was starting, but get, the, get it up here. So you're not, basically you're protecting yourself, but also you're, you're, not, you're never taking your eyes off. Thank you, sir. That was painless, wasn't it? But guys, Oh, you got your knife. Good job. Good job. Good job. But, you know, guys, something as simple as someone asking your time could be a distraction to get your focus on something else so they can attack you. I don't, I'm the magnet for people asking me directions. I don't know why. But, especially a few years ago when I-40 was shut down going through the mountains, 
between Cobb County and North Carolina. That's my exit I get off on in Newport. Getting gas. It happened three or four times during that time frame. There'd be somebody coming across there wanting to know if I'm on a shortcut all around this big long detour. <coughs> and in all honesty, the Glen right. Okay. I would, you know, pump gas. I'm not watching the TV screen that's on the thing. I'd see somebody at Glenn's distance from me. Hey, Glenn, how's it going? Or I didn't know your name, but hey, man, how's it going? I would let him know that I knew he was there. He was coming up. He would start the conversation at that distance, too. Hey, you know a way around? Is there a shortcut, a way to get across the mountain without going all the way up, maybe one and around? And we would have the conversation probably at four or five yards. But if I hadn't been aware, Lynn would have walked up on me. I'm standing there pumping the gas, watching the stupid dollars roll by, or watching the new TV screen that's on there. I'm totally glued to that instead of being aware of my surroundings. So be mindful of that. You know, Glenn may not want anything other than say hi. Or he might have been ready to knock my head off, take a video. You never know. But don't be shy, folks. Again, don't be like 45 and paranoid. But when you walk out of the Walmart or walk out of the West Town Mall, know where you parked. Be mindful of, you know, if you walk out there and there's four guys sitting on the hood of your vehicle. <laughs> now, the smart thing to do is to go back in, call for mile security, or call 911. Say, hey, I'm the West Town Mall. There's four guys sitting on the hood of my car and I don't know. Because if you go out there and wade into it, you're probably going to not have a positive outcome. Again, guys, what I told you earlier about being the best fight you can be in is not being one. Avoidance if you can. Now, I told y'all you're going to have to be the first responder to take the shooter out. You're also going to have to be the first responder to render first aid. Because guess what? You're already in the scene. You're already here. Law enforcement's not going to stop you from rendering aid to somebody that's got a gunshot on them. Where do you get first aid supplies from? Anybody got a clue? Glenn, you work here. Is there a first aid kit close around here somewhere? I don't work here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So I don't have a clue whether there's a first aid kit except for one. <laughs> Weighs less than a pound, folks. It's got a tourniquet, it's got a quick clot, it's got a bandage, and it's got a chest seal. Guess what? If I get shot, I can use it on the other. But if Tom gets shot, I can also use it on Tom. Now, most folks aren't going to. This. You can buy this stuff on eBay or Amazon, put it together for $75. It's peace of mind, folks. You don't ever know when something. And odds are you'll use this more than you'd ever use the gun. Because, and, and something to throw in that most people, you're going to use a band aid a thousand times more often than you're going to use a tourniquet. So put your couple band aids in it. Now, women, y'all got purses, and you can carry stuff in there. But do you have it with you and you go? Maybe, maybe not. But be mindful of folks, guys, that you're going to need to be have supplies available. I work in a healthcare setting. There's bandages everywhere. There's sheets. There's pillowcases. There's all kinds of stuff. But guess what? If I'm attacking the parking lot, I may be coming into work at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I may get shot in the parking lot. 
and nobody even knows that I'm shot. And then they come in the building. Well, I'm laying out there bleeding to death. Unless I can take care of my own injuries. So, the next class y'all need to take is first aid class, trauma class. You know, the Red Cross does them. There's lots of those available out there. A basic class, guys, could possibly save your life. Now, what else? Again, folks, I said backpacks. What is that? It's a piece of ballistic. It's part of a ballistic vest. It's an insert. Guess what? It'll fit right in a backpack. Really weighs nothing, guys. Weighs absolutely nothing. Is it going to stop rifle rounds? No, it's not. It's not rated for that. Is it going to defeat handgun rounds? Yes. It adds no weight to the backpack. No whatsoever. <coughs> Those are things, you know, your kids can't carry a knife to school. They can't carry tear gas to school. I don't even know if they carry flashlights to school. But guess what? Like you put this in a black bag. No one has no notes there. It's not the way the child may be. But it's a little bit of peace of mind. So well, not everybody's aware of the to go bag. They're not. They're not aware of the to go bag. But people carry computer bags, you carry a laptop, a laptop bags, your your other bags. Those will go in it. <coughs> and as a result of that, guess what? I'm getting shot at. I can use this, put it up in front of me, and basically the old shield. It's going to provide some level of protection. Because remember, there's really nothing in here that's going to provide any cover. Very little. So, to go bags, Computer bags, those inserts are around 100 bucks. Again, guys, what's your life for? We, we go through life hoping and praying for the best. You know, I've, again, guys, I've had more guns pointed at me and I'll be in law enforcement or the military and probably people can check a stick out. It's not normal. But, the stuff I do outside of my nursing home life, sometimes that happens. And you just deal with it. Uh, the first time it happened, it was kind of a little nerve wracking. But then, like anything else, the more you do it, the more you're used to it, you get, the more you think about how, well, how do you deal with it. Your mindset changes. In some of the classes I do, you know, the, the old thing, old saying was, I die for my wife, my husband, my child. It's the wrong mindset, folks. <coughs> the right mindset is I will take another life to be able to go home to my child. To my husband, to my wife. I can't teach that, guys. I can't teach it. That's something you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. Lynn has to make a choice back there. If there's a gunman and bust through that door behind him, he's the closest person to him. He's going to hit him with that nice camera. He already knows what he's going to do. But does everybody else in the room know what you're going to do? Already know what you're capable of doing. There's people out there that could fight, and there's some people that can't. It's just in their DNA. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you need to know what your capabilities are before you're faced with it. And that's again, folks, that is what this class is for. To make you aware that anybody, whether dressed in a business suit or in camo, can be a threat. Or anybody else in here potentially can be a threat. Because you all, pretty much all of you, has got some type of weapon on you. Whether it be a pen, whether it be a bottle, whether it be a cell phone. Pretty good impact weapons if you get some of them. Guys, 
I hope I haven't bored you today. Any questions, comments, concerns? Yes, sir. Do you think that the procedures that schools have in place, I remember during the Cold War when we were going to be nuked, they told us to get under desks. So it seems like nothing has changed. But do you think it's a lot of it is just based on liability? Potentially. Potentially it is liability. I mean, liability resources, it's all comes down to money. You know, if you had a, if, if we did the same security protocol at schools that we do at the airport, we probably wouldn't be in school shootings, in one mindset. Another mindset in school shootings, Israel's last school shooting, I think, was in the 70s. Again, this isn't politically correct. They armed all the teachers. And they were trained. So a school a potential school shooter would come in, they knew they were going to get shot by a teacher. So they would kind of avoid the school. Ma'am, you have a question? How much of that do you wear daily? <laughs> uh, the the two knives, uh, well, in reality, there's the one gun that was here is in the well, that model gun is in a different style holster on my hip for my commute to New York, which is 75 miles away. Then it's taken off and it goes and it's locked in the beginning. When I leave work, it goes back on my hip. <clears throat> when I get home, that gun becomes a nightstand gun with a flashlight on it. And one of the Glock 19s goes on my hip. And it's, I'm armed in my own house. You know, I live out in the country. I'm out working the garden, mowing, I got two acres of grass to mow. You know, there's a gun on me. That, and, and I hate to say it, but it's the truth. The only time I'm not armed is when I'm asleep, or when I'm in the shower. You know, when I'm at home. And, you know, when I'm in bed, there's one right, it's a nice thing to get. It's, it's within three feet of me. So, uh, and, and, it, and you say, it depends on where I'm going, what I'm doing. You know, there's times that I go places that there's three guns on my person. And 7,500 rounds of ammo alone. You know, and I hate to say this, but it's true. About, what, three or four months ago, we heard that on TV about the Navy, it was a Navy or Coast Guard officer that got arrested with his arsenal. He had a thousand rounds of ammo in his home. Guys, a thousand rounds of ammo in the real world ain't much. Hardly, but it's not. But the general public thinks a thousand rounds of ammo is a You know, KPD officer <laughs> now I think is carrying Four reloads, because they're carrying eight round mags now, more than 45. So, you know, they're carrying 32. They're carrying 41 rounds on the person. Uh, when they were carrying blocks, they were carrying 30, 46 rounds. You know, that's on the person. And then they've got other resources in their vehicles. But that's a typical officer. You know, military going out on a mission, your loadout was with an AR-15, it was usually about 10 mags and 30. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, talking to uh, Kyle Lamb, who was one of the Delta operators here in Somalia, Black Hawk now, uh, their typical loadout at that time was 10, 30 round mags. So they would carry 300 rounds of ammo, plus the 30, so 330. So, you know, they were a massive firefight. Yeah, they got resupplied. Some I took some off their fallen comrades. But guys, you can't ever have enough ammo. You know, it's like you can't ever have enough training in life. You can't ever. You got to be safe. You got to be safe with all this stuff. You got to be trained in how to use. It's dangerous. You know that that. 
any of these guns, if they were fully loaded, lay in there until somebody comes and picks them up. There is no more danger in the fire extinguisher than in the wall. It's just a tool. That knife's a tool. The flashlight's a tool. The computer's a tool. It's a different phone. Now, if I was armed and somebody came in that door back there, I could dispatch the threat from back here. But if I wasn't armed, I can't do anything until they're armed reach for me. So I would rely on somebody else in the crowd to start that process until they can you know, get some help. Any more questions, sir? Is that ballistic insert uh, enough to set off a uh, metal detector? And there's nothing metal in it. It's just it's Kevlar. It's Kevlar. And some of the plates now that they're making, and they're, they're actually the plate, the polymer plates. Uh, and I'll be swapping out probably because I found a new company. Uh, they don't weigh much of nothing, but they'll stop rifle rounds. So I'll be swapping that out for those because it's just, just another added layer of protection. And they will, they're polymer too, so they will sell the man. Well, this is just a question for those who do handle guns. So if you're in a situation, you always shoot to kill. Like if you've gotten to the point where you are going to shoot, you're always going to do a fail. Your terminology is shoot to stop. Shoot to stop. I, neutral, I shoot until I neutralize the threat. Now, if I have to empty that 17 round magazine into you and reload and empty it before you leave me alone. <laughs> but terminology of shooting to kill is not that's a litigious statement. Uh, but are you what you're I guess alluding to is you're gonna try to shoot me in the arm, right? Instead of shooting me center mass. Okay. Alright. I know I'm supposed to be done at three. If y'all anybody needs to leave you can, but I'm good forever. I can talk about this stuff forever. Come here, man. <laughs> or you can say where you are. Okay. I'm standing still. I'm not going to be. I'll shoot one the gun at you. Oh, okay. and, and try to hit my arm as I move. Okay. <laughs> so you have to repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, that goes with law enforcement as well. That's why their hit ratio is so limited. You're trying to hit me as I whipped up those steps. That was a hard target to aim at, wasn't it? All you were seeing was my body. Okay. Okay. But you're trying to shoot me in the arm or shoot me in the leg. But this is center mass. So. Okay, so. Well, I mean, it, shoot to kill is not a proper term. Shoot to wound, again, if I'm a static target, if you're just going to sit there and let me shoot you, I can shoot you in your left shoulder. But if you start bobbing and weaving amongst these people, it's going to your main center, the largest area I can hit. I may hit you in the arm, but I'm aiming for your center torso. So, you know, that's something that you need to be mindful of is shoot the wound unless you're just totally static in place. It's going to be hard to do.
I'm sorry? Depending for you hit him. Right. But he, he was still 100 yards. Mm -hmm. But he still went 100 yards. But when you field dress it, the lungs and heart are a mess. They're both, they're gone. He was dead as soon as you pulled the trigger. But his body didn't know he was dead until 100 yards later. And all that deer is on is the deer adrenaline. All the drugs and stuff that people have access to now, they can be so piled up. They can be shot all to pieces and not realize they're that way because their body's still functioning. A buddy of mine was shot in the chest by accident. But he told me, he said, for the first minute, he said, I could have done something. After that, he started fading in the family. But, you know, folks that's been in the military, that's been in combat, you know, folks have, but the human body is tough. And your will to live, and that's something else, guys, you have a right mindset. You know, if you just, something happens, and you're going to cowl down and say, okay, I'm done, I'm going to go, you might. Have my have a proper fighting positive mindset that hey, I'm going home tonight. I'm going to save my kids. I'm going to save my wife. I'm going to save my husband. I'm going to be able to get home tonight. So, anything else, guys? I'll pass my time. Again, guys, thank you all for your attendance. Uh,